Uh, so thanks everybody for joining um, on a latish on a Friday afternoon. Appreciate your time. Um, we're just going to do a one hour session, um, primarily not for me to talk, speak, but for you guys to ask questions. But um, we we said that we would do um, some walkthroughs, playbacks of, of the plan and uh, we in round one we we did this uh, very early on in the process because a lot of people were getting familiar with the plan and the documents and it took a while to get up to speed so we did it quite early on this time we're doing it later in the process because we wanted to give you a chance to read the documents and come armed with uh, with questions well not literally armed but hopefully uh, coming with some questions uh, on the basis of having read the documents so that's partly why we've done this slightly later uh, this time round um, so if we go to the the, the next slide, uh, Joe. <clears throat> so we, we all know the, the background for this one. Uh, pr primarily, as you know, in round one, we set out um, a fairly high level set of documents, uh, quite a lot of uncertainties or assumptions, but it was a way of getting people onto the same page in terms of what the plan might look like and how the delivery might be effected. In round two, uh, we believe we've progressed the plan to, to an extent. So I wouldn't say it's fully progressed because there's still an ongoing process, but the plan we gave you this time was a bit more specific. It had actual dates in there rather than dates you had to work out yourself. And um, we feel that we've progressed in terms of the uh, the potential approach to SIT and the way SIT might work. Um, and also we've been more clear about the base assumption for migration that we're likely to follow. And we've probably not progressed as well or as fully as we would have liked on qualification. And that may well be something that we we pick up in, in the session, but certainly uh, we think that we've progressed the subject to an extent, um, but whilst recognising that a planning process is going to be full of imperfections, even at this stage and, and, and later, uh, the important thing is to get to a plan that we can baseline that has acceptable levels of imperfection in it um, and uncertainty, because that certainly will still be the case when we baseline the plan, but at least we get on the same page. Uh, together um, on, on, on the way we're going to deliver the program. The the next slide, uh, Joe, which is the um, uh, the outcome. I would just point to the outcome at the bottom of the slide. We we said that for uh, round two, uh, we would first of all truncate this to three weeks. Um, and, and the reason for that was that we were going to ask less questions, but also um, we wanted to give ourselves and everybody else more time to engage and and absorb the the feedback and uh, the way in which the plan may turn out uh, to look. So in, in that sense, uh, the outcomes of round two, we're hoping to identify uh, be much better approaches and assumptions uh, to be clear about dates and durations, uh, have, have something which is fit. So once we've iterated the plan after round two, that's fit for around three short uh, consultation period, which is mainly kicking the tires on a plan which we hope everybody will be at least um, acknowledging and reasonably comfortable with. So there's a long way to go yet in that it's, it's a challenging time. And um, we've basically made the point that until and unless we get the outcome of round two that we want, it would be difficult to go into that final round three consultation period. We, we've made it clear in a number of places that uh, we need to get to a baseline plan as early as possible because we can't run a program without it. Currently, we have a timetable which is being used as a baseline, but it doesn't have the underpinning planning documentation that turns it from our perspective into a plan. Um, whereas we want to get to a baseline plan that does have that evidence and the thinking and the engagement with industry so that we can proceed with something that everybody believes is achievable. So it, it's it's important to, to, to get to that point. Um, so if we move on to the next slide. Um, so I've made the point that we've, if you like, set out set out a, a range of documents which we feel is a progression. We we also outlined not a plan but a timeline, which we called the challenge timeline, and that that is what I would characterise as the the happiest path based on logic of how things might be able to happen if you don't have any contingency, if you accept a much higher level of risk, and you make the assumption that bad things won't happen all the way through the journey. And so it's not, we're not characterising this as, as a very realistic plan, but we have set out a timeline for uh, a more challenging timeline as a basis for starting a conversation about a range of dates. The important thing, the important thing, 
I'm getting getting echoes now. If everybody can mute, that'd be great. Um, thank you. The, the so the challenge timeline isn't a plan, but it's a it's a reference point to provoke um, really important responses that we're seeking to get from you in the consultation, and it's to start the conversation about potentially ranges of dates. There are precedents and fast switching. There was a range of dates around a go live window. It may well be that a baseline program plan has some ranges of dates in it. So by having a POAP one and a POAP two, it starts the conversation about different takes on what might be possible and a range of dates that might be possible. Uh, but I would again say that the POAP one, the illustrated uh, plan that we provided documentation on, we're not saying that that is the plan either at this stage because it doesn't have the evidence underpinning. I said that at the open day that we're far from being able to even evidence that POAP one is achievable and realistic based on the amount of evidence we have currently. So anyway, that that's the basis for it, and I'll go into that a little bit more later on before my, my colleagues uh, plough into this as well. Um, so we set the consultation questions out. We promised to make less of them, which we did. We've tried to articulate and frame the kinds of answers that we'd like to get using the POAP 1 and POAP 2 reference points uh, to kind of provoke. Uh, and we are seeking positive and negative responses. So even if you think that you support something we're saying, we'd like to know why you support it in the same way as if you don't support it, we'd like to know why you don't. So we, we, we have asked questions on both sides, both positive and ne negative aspects um, to get the best thinking. Uh, and the really important thing to say is that you know everybody's response is going to be uh, very helpful to us. There was a, con we had one of these sessions earlier uh, and a good question about how we might weight the responses. Uh, and, and my response to that was we don't really weight them what we're looking for is there will be important areas of the plan that different constituencies will be particularly uh, uh, interested in. For example, we were speaking with suppliers about uh, sit entry and sit, but also in terms of, uh, of, of mig migration. So there are elements there where there might be specific nuggets of information and we might get a hundred responses if we're really lucky. And maybe just one response comes from one participant that makes a really good evidenced, argue, well argued point about why something can be done faster or will have to be done more slowly. If we get just one response, but it's an obvious and very strong point, we will use that. So we will wait it just the fact that one participant made it. If it makes sense to us, then we'll use it in the arguing the plan and building out the plan. So every response we get will be important and you never know where this information might come from. And we've been just trying to, to, to say to people, don't rely on other people to, to, to make the responses. You know, take the ownership yourselves. Um, you, you get a plan that you deserve. So give us the responses. And I, I think that we are trying to and we're hoping to demonstrate that we are listening and the, the inputs that we've had from parties are starting to be reflected in the planning documentation that we were putting together. Um, and again, working uh, with you to, to build that you know, industry credible plan. So we will try to maintain the integrity of the exercise whilst putting pressure on the timelines to try to get this thing done as quickly as possible, which I think, you know, many of you and many participants want to get this programme done quickly, but we need to set ourselves up to succeed, not to fail. And that's the important point of, of the exercise. So again, if we don't get to a good point, we won't rush to a baseline plan if we don't think we're ready. And it will be we who actually make the, the 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 points that if we need more time for the planning, then that's what we will do. We will not, you know, lose integrity of the process by trying to get something over the line for the sake of it. It's really important to bring you along with us um, and for us to reach that point at the right time. But of course, we want to get that plan in place because I'd like to, if you like, displace the existing timetable with something that everybody's signed up to. Next slide. Um, yeah, we, we 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 promised to give some rules on or some guidance on evidence. Um, we we made the point to Ofgem, uh, and we asked Ofgem what they would see to be uh, suitable evidence that they would be looking for. Uh, primarily, they're looking for plans. They're either looking for plans you've developed, plans you are developing, thinking estimates, assumptions that are baked into your draft plans. It's all about the plans or, and the provision of those. And we know that many participants may not have completed that high level planning yet. In fact, until M3, M3 is where, where we expect everybody to have high level uh, delivery plan, but you'll, you'll be building those at the moment. So we recognize that you may not have fully formed plans, but 
what you can provide are work in progress plans or thinking that it is baked into your current plans. That would be the most persuasive evidence. Another good example would be experience in other such programs or where you've done similar activities in other programs that you can evidence and provide quantifiable uh, backup to uh, in terms of, of things that you think how long things will take to get done, such as migration, for example. Um, mm -hmm. And, and the experience that you have from other programs would be really good evidence as long as it was quantified. So we, if you if you like this slide, the most important things at the top, and probably the lesser important things, <coughs> we've just tried to uh, to provide that uh, that kind of guidance. And then on the uh, the last two slides, we have the uh, the, the POAP slides. Um, and obviously, the the POAPs. You can't respond to the questions that we've asked just by looking at the parks. You have to look at the underpinning uh, project plan. We we have had some kind of feedback in sessions where I think people are trying to do it just based on the PO app and asking us to expand the PO app out. Um, th there's a couple of good points that have been made, but generally speaking, the PO app is just an illustration to guide you into the detailed uh, project schedule documents and the raids. So we would encourage people to look at the detail as well as just these pictures. Um, but this this POAP one is the illustrative timeline. It's, it's the one that has the underpinning documents. We would like to get evidence that either supports this timeline or doesn't. But at the moment, it's a timeline which ha doesn't have the backup and the evidence that will persuade Ofgem that we should delay the programme from the timetable by as much as this. Um, but obviously, we, we, we've illustrated that as completely as we could to get your views on that. The, the last slide is the POAP one, sorry, POAP two, um, and, and that, that, as I say, is a device uh, to provoke uh, the right kinds of evidence and feedback from yourselves. We're not saying this is a realistic plan. I think there's thinking at this level that might be interesting to debate, but this is all you're getting. It's a timeline. That, that's all it is. Um, but there is logic behind it, uh, as I say, without contingency, with high risk, with an assumption that nothing bad will happen when we go through this. So uh, we're not we're not portraying this as a credible plan in any sense, but it is really important to say there's a logic, a, a kind of logic <laughs> being able to think more quickly, um, which is arguable. But I'll, I'll say no more than that because I, I, you know we need to be frank and honest with the with with us with ourselves and with each other about what we've done and why we've done it. So I, I hope I've explained why we've put this in but more than happy to take uh, questions on it. Now, uh, we said ourselves that we wouldn't spend too much of the session um, uh, leading in, so 15 minutes was our uh, target, and then to leave the last 45 minutes for questions, which I think we're going to do now. Uh, and we'll take questions on a hands up basis, first come, first served. Um, really hope that we we get questions and that you've had a chance to chew on the documents and, and, and there are probably things that you'd like to know from us. Um, and I've got um, you know, key members of my team here to help answer questions. Kate is here and as is Jason. Over to you guys. What questions would you like to ask us? Or have you come to hear what other people want to ask? Which is always possible as well. The first one's always the hardest. <laughs> ask a small one just to get the process going. That's often a, a good way to start this. I'm sure there's stuff in here that you weren't expecting to see or, or needs further explanation. Or more, it might be you're more used to the process now and, and you're you know, going to give us the responses. The, um, well, if we if we don't have any questions, we might want to prime the pump. Uh, Jason or Kate may want to um, you know summarize some of the things we've been discussing with other groups, if they're relevant to this group. Um, I, I do have one, in fact, I don't mind being brave and yeah, throwing a question it. out yeah, there. <laughs> um, I, is, is there any clarification on the Pitt, Sit and Newit entry yet? So what do we have to have in place before we are, um, this, this is all because we have planning workshops yeah. ongoing at the moment, so that we can understand what we need to get in place and done by the time we can go into Pitt, Sit and Newit. I think that's one for Kate. Uh, yeah, OK, so um, pit entry, I think, is really up to you. So what what we'll be interested in is pit exit. Um, and 
you know, pit exit will feed into either you going into sit if if that's what you've decided and you've got ready in time, or it will feed into you going into qualification. And so there's there's a sort of a gateway there that the program will be interested in. So from the if you're exiting pit and going into sit, then we will be assuring you for that. If you're exiting pit and going into qualification, then it's going to be the BSC PAB or you know its consultants who will be um, the gatekeepers of that. So that so that's that bit. Um, sit entry, obviously, you know the pit exit of the various people who are doing it is is one of the things, but you know there are others. No, we we haven't got the detailed sit entry criteria yet. Um, and that is something that we're aware that we need to work on. I mean, there, they, you know, there's a bit of a priority on these things because I yes. think qualification is is probably the biggest um, area where we've had to make um, where we've had to make assumptions at the moment, and and that is desperate. That is in desperate need of clarification and further work. You know, and that's not just us. That's you know, work with the BSC, with SEC um SECAS and with um RETCO as well so that's kind of the top of our hit list the criteria for getting into SIT is is close behind so we're not there yet but we will so getting out of SIT um probably what I'll 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 do in a minute you know when there are no yeah. more questions then I'll I'll I've got a, a, a sort of a bit of a spiel about SIT and how that how we see that working on the, on this PO app. So I'll cover it then. And then for getting into um, so you the you using the UIT environment, that's either qualification or the end-to-end -end sandbox. And basically to get into the end-to-end -end sandbox where you can do your own testing and you decide what you want to do without any input from us, all we provide is a testing service. To get into that, either you have to have completed SIT or you have to have completed the qualification testing. And I say qualification testing as distinct from the overall qualification process, because there's more to qualification than just doing the testing that we're going to, you know, that you're going to be doing on the integrated environment. There's obviously all the, there's the process element, the SAD and things like that. So when you've done the qualification testing and passed that, then you can get onto the end to end sandbox okay and there's a, a follow-on question really when you're yep. talking about uh, either going into sit which i understand is is by invitation into quotes the cohort um can you do that by role or do you have to put all of your roles into sit or all of your roles into qualification because we have one role that we, we want to go into sit with but the others won't be ready yet yep. so can we start sit and then add others in later or into right. sit OK, so I think what I'm going to do is give you my sitch feel. Um, and that will answer that question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. So, Joe, can you make it a little bit um, bigger so that we can just focus in on the. Yeah, perfect. OK, so we are our color coding's not been the best and that's you have my apologies for that. We should have kind of gathered all sit together under one color coding, but basically you've got Apart from the migration design, which we just wanted to call out separately at the top, um, then you've got the next few rows, uh, the next few swim lanes, one, two, three, four. The, the three blue ones and the first purple one are about participants who are going to participate in SIT. So the way that we've envisaged SIT is a bit different in, um, in this round. So what we had before was we had, you know, selected number of participants. We wanted a minimum number and, and, and things like that. You all start on the on a given date. So what we've done is we had a bit more thought about this. And so we want to encourage participation in SIT because obviously the the better we can test the overall solution in SIT, the better it's going to be for everybody, because we know that once we go live, we won't get too many defects and so on. And the other thing that we 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 kind of set ourselves as a task was, OK, well, how can we get some people, some participants through SIT and out the other end and live as quickly as possible? 
So what we've said here is that um, we, we're going to stick with the initial three months. And then um, if, if you look at the minimum viable cohort SIP PP swim lane, the top blue one, there's three months of impact assessment, planning, procurement before um, you drop into DBT. And then that the planning and so on carries on, but you've done enough after three months to allow you to start DBT is the idea. So you start DBT design, build and test. And, and that design, build and test is of the components of the overall ecosystem that are necessary for SIT. So we've said it's the services, in other words, um, data services, registration services, and so on. And it's also, <clears throat> um, from the supplier's point of view, it's the DIP interfaces. Now, what it's not from the supplier's point of view is your sales systems, it's not your customer correspondence systems, all of that sort of stuff that we've bracketed in the supplier core systems, which can be produced on a parallel and different timeline. So you go, we, we've allowed the same front end, the three months plus 12 months for design, build and test of what's necessary for SIT. So that's not changed from round one. What's changed is how we get into SIT and how we get through it. So what we've said now is that we are going to allow anyone into SIT who wishes to do so and can get ready in time. And ready in time is, um, we have a two month period where we do what we call component integration testing in the beginning. And, and that's a kind of a stepwise approach, adding a different component or role, as if you, if you prefer, into the, the sort of the working ecosystem. So we start, obviously we start with the dip and you, you've got, so this the, the, the top blue swim lane is just about participants. The central systems is the next one down. And obviously, you know, we can't start sitting until all the central systems are there clearly. So we're, you know, they've got to be there. Um, so the DIP is a central system that needs to be there. Elexon central systems will integrate with the DIP. Then we'll pull in registration services and uh, then data services and so on and so forth. And we'll build out until the whole of the architecture diagram is represented and everything's communicating and working. And that is with whoever wishes to do that and gets there in time and getting there in time is at your specified time over the two month period because if you are Elexon Central Systems you, you need it in the beginning if you're um, the DSP that's not needed until a bit later um, and, and, and so on and if you're a supplier that's not needed until a little bit later as well so um, but in addition to the staged adding, what we're saying is we're we're going to allow a month wiggle room in case people have last minute problems. If you intend to participate and you can do so within a month of your you know, declared start time, then we will take you. We're not going to flex it any more than that, but we wanted to be a bit flexible without making too much of a rod for our own backs in terms of managing that. So we flex the entry into SIT and we've said, whoever wants to come and play can come and play. So then you had a specific question about, um, about roles and, and operating in different roles. You can come in to sit in however few or many roles you wish to do so. If you have one role that's gonna be ready and others which aren't, please, please bring that role in. Okay, um, that's good to know. Me. Yeah, absolutely. Now, yeah, so, so, you know, and we really encourage, you know, and we're looking to you guys, quite frankly, to lead the way and to, you know, because you are the guys, you're, you're so engaged, you're so, you've been so engaged in the design process and so on, you know, you've got commercial incentives to really get this moving. So yeah, please, whatever's ready in whatever role, yeah, we'd love to have you. So, so that's that. And then what we've got here, I'll, 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 
come on to you in a second, Robert. Let me just finish this stream of thought. Um, so that's the start of SIT. So what we're going to do then is once we've got everything plugged in and things flowing through the dip in the in the right way, then we're going to start SIT functional. And once we've started SIT functional, we're going to very carefully monitor the progress of each of the testing participants. And after a short period, which will be, I don't, I'm guessing, you know, a couple of months or something like that, we will take a call, make a call on um, which participants are testing quickly, which ones are testing slightly less quickly, and try to kind of stratify it so that we put together what we've called a minimum viable cohort, which is all the different, um, the different, a set of the different roles who we think can test quickly together and get out of sit as quickly as possible. And then, you know, we'll do the same for a set of roles that are testing maybe at a slightly slower speed. And they absolutely can carry on in sit. It's just that they may not get through quite so quickly. And the, you know, just bearing in mind, the point of sit is to verify that the design works. Um, in an end to end sense, it's not to give each of you a tick in the box as a participant. That is a byproduct of having gone through SIT. That's not the purpose of SIT. But we're using that as a vehicle to encourage you because, you know, nobody would come and play if you had to do SIT and then you had to do qualification testing on top. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a byproduct. So, um, Robert, please go ahead. I just wanted to finish off that little bit. Uh, yeah, thanks. That's, uh, that's, that's useful. Um, I'm just um, uh, wondering when we we'll get uh, a bit more detail on the availability timeline within SIT of, of some of those parts that you've said, because uh, that will, I guess, might drive the prioritisation of how we approach our development. So you might go, OK, well, let's develop our, uh, a, a sort of a, a common module for um, for smart um uh smart data services advanced uh, um and and then the equivalent for metering service as well that does registration and you might go okay well we'll get that ready and that needs to align with when the registration services are available in sit or uh, or you might say actually we'll focus on just smart data services again just an example end to end to get that in first and then move on to um, uh, uh, advanced data services. So the timing of which yeah. pieces of set are available at what time will really help. Well, will help prioritize development and, yeah. and equally whether we can put part of a system into set as it's available. While, you know, um, rather than the whole, you know, the whole end to end in SIT might not be available, but registration might be available to test or dip uh, or whatever. So having that granularity and uh, being assured that the flexibility of, of, of being in SIT and not having to present maybe a whole product in one go, but enough to do testing of what's available in SIT at that time. You know, yeah. it, just getting a bit of clarity on that really. Yeah, and, sure. So what, what we are going to do is, you know, once we've got the plan um, agreed, we we always said that we would go back and um, review the end to end testing and integration strategy, because all this kind of thing is um, is talked about in the strategy in, in some bits in more detail than others. And the, the bit about the component integration and how the bits are added and in what sequence is not very, it's covered, but it's not not in much detail. So we do need to go into more detail than that. But so we will do that. Um, the only thing I can say about it, though, is that you're not looking at much of a time difference. You know, we're talking about starting with the dip and ECS on day one, and then by day 60, we'll have got everybody in. You know, so you only have that kind of two month period to add in the bits. So I, and and what we will need on the data services. We will need a data service, it, you know, a data service fully functioning. So we will need if, if you're in the smart data service area, we will need a smart data service functioning. You know, we won't need a bit of that. 
or we will need a an advanced data service functioning. Now, the only um, the only point where that's not quite true is that we've said we would expect people to bring their fully functioning systems or bits of systems, you know, in the supplier case, you know, it's the interfacey bits, the smart interface you were talking about. Um, but we are thinking that because the migration design is kind of lagging a bit behind and also because we're now talking about reverse migration and a design needs to be done for that, we are talking about dropping the migration related bits of code into the system after the beginning of SIT. But other than that, we would expect, you know, a, the component to be fully formed when we put it into SIT. Does that make sense? That that make, makes sense. Um, and, and I guess that 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 sort of um, lends itself to you know when, when you're when you're sort of prioritizing your development that you you focus on a full end to end of product rather than staging it out. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Components. Yeah. Okay. You know, so if if you're in the smart and advanced space, then you know, pick which is more important to your business and and focus on that and make sure that you really get that into sit. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, that's great. Thanks. I have one other question. Um, what what environments are you putting up for us to test against? Will there just be a single test environment? In which case, um, will the stubs and emulators for each of the interfaces precede the actual DIT being ready for us to test against? Or right. are there multiple that's, environments? No, there, there, there will be multiple environments. So, um, yeah, so this is um, a piece of information that we, so the same question came up in another, um, another of our presentations yesterday. And what, what we're going to do is early next week, we're going to put out some supplementary information, which will answer some of the, you know, common questions that have been coming up in these sessions. And environments is one of them. So, you know, we, we appreciate that, the environments working group is working on this, but not everybody's um, been able to attend that. So what we will do is we will just put out some guidance of where things currently are in, in terms of our thinking about environments and what the environments working group has done. But broadly speaking, what we are asking for is in, you know, in PIT, it's up to you how you do that. That's your environment, nothing to do with us. You know, we're going to be asking for evidence of the testing that you've done, but we don't care whether you use five environments or one. You know, that's up to you. Okay. So for SIT, um, we will be asking. Um, yeah, we, we, we'll, we'll confirm this next week, but I think what we're talking about is we're talking about a an environment on which SIT functional and functional migration will be tested and then a different mm -hmm. environment on which non-functionals can be tested and there may be one other I can't remember but uh, you know th there are specific things that we're going to need for SIT so anybody who participates in SIT we're going to be saying okay guys you know we need you to provide these environments and that's down to us to um, coordinate the environment provision and work with you to make sure that basic connectivity can be tested and things like that. So, so that's it. And then for for you, it um, that's your qualification. If you do qualification, and then end to end sandbox. So we will be asking the central systems. ECS, um, DSP, CSS, EES, the DIP. Um, I always forget one, but anyway, you get the drift. The, so the central yeah. systems plus um, plus DNOs, and I, I I can't remember off the top of my head whether we've said all DNOs and IDNOs. I don't think we have, but you know enough DNOs and IDNOs to be able to do testing. That collection will provide be standing up environments to provide a testing service, essentially, a bit like the the UIT 
testing service that was provided for smart metering. Um, it's there. You can book a slot, you can connect up and you can do whatever testing you want in the sandbox. So, okay. yeah. So the, the requirements are different depending on what role you are. But, you know, for you as agents, that will be a testing service that you can use. Now, um, quite how we do it in terms of ensuring that in the sandbox, you know, you as an agent have got a relevant supplier to test with, don't know. I, I suspect that might be down to you guys to arrange. In in SIT, what we're, what we're doing is we're saying that we're, we're not, for SIT, as far as SIT's concerned, any commercial arrangements that you've got between suppliers and agents and so on are, are just irrelevant. You know, you as an agent, you're going to be talking to the dip and sending things back and forth um, mm -hmm. as a supplier ditto. So, you know, you may well find if you're in SIT that you're actually testing with somebody who's not a customer of yours. Well, fine, you know, you, you're going to be exchanging the same kind of messages anyway. Um, what we're looking for is not a, a sort of a commercially related cohort necessarily going through SIT, but, you know, a, co a decent cohort that provide enough of the different services and so on that can get through SIT quickly. And stubs and emulators, they're not pieces of software that we would run on our own internal systems. They are actually on central systems. Is, is that right. right? That's a good point. Sorry, I, I forgotten you said that. Right. So um, what we've got. Uh, you can see along the top that we've got three chunks. One is pit stubs, one is sit, and one is UIT. So pit yeah. stubs. What we're doing, and um, there's there's actually a, a show and tell because we've just reached the end of another sprint on on the simulator. It's going on right now, so I'm I'm kind of, you know, um, yeah. I, I unfortunately I can't go and see what they've got to, but they've been developing that over the last few months. So. The, the pit stubs are two things. They so they they do what they say on the tin. They're there to help you in your pit. They'll also be useful in testing further down the line as well, I think. But so the um, the first thing is a dip simulator because the real dip won't be available until much later on. Obviously, it's mm -hmm. it's possible that whoever the dip provider is, they may be. You know, it's possible they may be able to provide some kind of simulation facilities, but we don't know about that. Um, and we won't know because it's not they're not chosen yet and, and all of that. So what we said was, OK, well, we'll do a fairly simple simulator that will allow um, kind of pass through from the dip. And and so what we've got at the moment is we've got we, we've developed this simulator and we just, you know, in some you know, in successive sprints, we're building the functionality for IF21 and IF22. So we're just hitting the main consumption um, flows at the moment. Um, yeah. And the idea is that we will simulate, um, yeah, we'll simulate the dip receiving a, an IF21. Um, we'll then, um, squirt the IF21 out the other end to, for example, LSS or MDS um, and, and things like that, and then get a response back, but in a, in a relatively simple way. So that that's what that simulator is there for. And what we need to explore, and I, I feel really bad because I say this in these meetings and then I just haven't had a chance to talk to Lee Northall yet, but um, I think Lee is keen because they've gone, they've got a long way ahead on the Alexon Central Systems development. Um, you know, Lee has is, is said for some time, we're really keen to provide our real systems as testing aids if that's possible. And so, you know, the answer is, well, given our simulator plus the ECS real systems, you know, that can be that if we can do it, we can set up a testing service whereby you as a data service say you you send in your consumption information it gets to mds and you get the relevant response back from the real mds okay so that that's the sort of thing that we're we're aiming at but as i said we're doing the simulator that's for sure 
the hookup with ECS, that's something that we remains to be talked about, but that's what we would like to do. So the other thing for pit stubs um, is that um, we're doing, we, we're developing some data generators and we're doing this for smart and for advanced. And the idea is that you, you know, you provide, I don't know, a long list of MPANs and some meter technical details that go with them and various other, you know, the last consumption figures or, or whatever. Um, and our tool will generate the consumption data for a specified date. And, you know, there'll be things in there like you can say, maybe set a a parameter that says, you know, 10% 10, 10 of these meters are non-responding, therefore we only get 90% of the data set back or, you know, things like that. So so it's yeah. basically about generating bulk amounts of data that can be used in testing. So those are the two things in the pit stubs and the, um, the simulators are coming first and the data generators are coming in May, that the, the simulators are targeted in Q1 of next year. OK, and the expectation yeah. is that the, the dip will be sometime after February 24. Is that correct? I can't say. I don't okay. I, I don't. Yes, I genuinely don't know. Yeah, that's fine. That's It'll fine. be, Thank you know, it's all subject to the procurement process I, 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 and I don't know. So the and, and then there are some other things that are going to help us with SIT and UIT, but it's probably, yeah, it's not worth going into too much detail about those. The pit things, I think, are the things that hopefully will be helpful to you yeah. guys. Oh, sorry, I know what I wanted to say was that um, what we're contracted to do is um, provide um, the DIP simulator with regard to the consumption interfaces and the um, the load shapes. What What we are just agreeing with the SRO team at the moment is expanding that to cover registration and the other the other flows as well. Okay. So at the moment we've got you, you'll get consumption and load shapes um, and hopefully the the rest will come later. Thank you. Yeah, Tom, sorry, you've been waiting. I think it's actually me first. Sorry, Tom. Oh, That's apologies, okay. James. I thought that was That's sorry. All right. No I'm problem. Using, I thought that was your question. Yeah, go ahead, James. <laughs> it's all right, noise. Um, just a quick clarification, really. Earlier, you said that you wanted fully functioning smart data services for SIT. Um, are you expecting that to include MDR functionality as well? Because I'm not sure if the timeline for that being available aligns with SIT execution. We would be. So okay. if that is an issue, then that needs to be raised in your response to the consultation. OK. Yeah, definitely. So. Um, yeah, MP162 is the, the mod that's implementing that new MDR DCC user role. Um, it's just been sent back to CCAS. And I think they're aiming for February 2024 to implement yeah. that. No, I know. I know. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I, we are dependent. Uh, we're well connected into the. Yeah. Sorry, Jason, you you've broken up. So start again. Oh, sorry. I think uh, I think I dropped in and out a bit there, Kate. Yeah, I was just going to say um, that um, James, we're pretty well connected into the MP one six two discussions. Yeah. Um, the as as you know. Uh, the the direction to CCAS is to bring that back to Ofgem for the 31st of October at the moment, so they can make a decision on on the MDR implementation. Yeah. Uh, and there is a there is a working group that's been lined up for uh, either next week or the week after for that. So we're we're continuing to input into that, but it is a a, a CCAS governed um, process that's being followed now. Um, it was yeah. originally being planned for the February release. Uh, I think now that's going to be a later release. Um, okay. If it is the June release, then that's still in time to get it in before um, the DSP re-procurement backstop. 
So um, th there is some leeway on implementation date, but we need to see what comes out of the CCAS process. Yeah, I guess it would just be good to understand if um, prospective MDRs can go through the user entry process tests ahead of that implementation date so that they're in a position to have a fully functioning SDS for SIT so or as early as possible in SIT. Yeah, the expectation will be that um, DCC will have their services ready uh, when we need them into component integration testing um, in line yeah. with when we're going to get SDS in to test the MDR element of it. Okay. Yeah. So um, that that's that is that is the expectation at the moment. DCC are, are just doing some planning to overlay our timelines onto theirs as well. So I was just talking to them about that earlier on. OK, all right. Thank you. So, just just one thing to add on that, James. We, yeah. we wouldn't expect the the um, amended DSP to be live before we start to sit. Well, the, the point we've got to get to with the new DSP release is we've got to we got it's got to get out of sit and it's got to have done at least some of you of it you it mm. if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that does. Sorry, I, sh I should have been clearer on that, um, Kate. Yeah, we're not expecting necessarily that to be go live, depending on how the yeah. how the yeah. timescales line up. Yeah, yeah. But we need yeah. we we need them to have identified a test environment to drop it into, um, to make it available for our SIT testing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. Tom. Yeah, just a disappointment at looking at this plan of how. The whole program slipped back a number of years. Um, that's just an observation. Um, just picking up on your point about testing. Um, you talked about the consumption flow being an example. To be honest, it's the interactions with registration that bother me most. Right. Um, because they are multiple and they are. There's a variety of scenarios, sunny day and things where it will potentially go wrong. That'll need yeah. testing there. Um, okay. So that's the area I'd be most worried about okay. in terms of testing. Okay. So we, we, so so the um, the SRO team has picked up on that as well, and that's why we're talking to them about um, you know trying to represent those as well. And I'm I'm sure that we will. I just don't I I can't and and I think we're looking to do we're looking to get some of those interfaces in in the Q1 delivery of the simulators, but not all of them. And I don't know when the rest will come in. I think it, you know, it, it's possible they may come in with the data generators in the May time frame. So, but it's definitely something that we're looking at. And and again, you know, put that in your consultation response, please do, that that's the area that you think requires the most attention. just to respond to the comment about the programming slip this isn't the plan just to reiterate this is an illustration uh the, the plan is still the timetable at the moment so there's no slippage at this stage but we do need to understand if there is going to be slippage from the timetable that's the exercise we got in front of us just keeping on your toes keith <laughs> <laughs> hey i'm on my toes but not to not to exit stage left <laughs> I mean, if, if 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 Joe was showing the top right hand uh, part of the screen, Tom, it would show all the caveats uh, associated with the plans. But um, just I'm I'm conscious of of time, and um, I just wanted to cover a couple of other elements of of the plan because we concentrated quite a lot on the on the sit, and rightly so because that is an important um, element of the plan that's changed and our approach to um, MVC. But I also want to just um, just to cover the migration elements at the back end before we before we um, lose time, and uh, and that those are the twelve month migration periods we've got at the at the end of the process, both at the end of the blue bars for for the SIT participants, but also at the end of the purple bars for the um, uh, qualification uh, participants, the non SIT participants. A couple of things to highlight on there. For, firstly. We have maintained a 12-month assumption for migration timescales. 
we've been having a number of uh, discussions with the migration working group and bilaterally with with some of the suppliers who've got experience of migration to um, check those migration time scales. But we'd very much appreciate any feedback we get back from from you as as agents. Obviously, a lot of you have had experience of bulk change of agent processes, uh, supporting uh, mass change supplier and solar events uh, and the like. So. Um, any any feedback that you can provide on on the migration timescales would be appreciated. And particularly, Keith ran through that evidence slide earlier. If you've got experience of bulk change of agent and other migration um, processes, and you're able to quantify that activity and relate it to the scale of activity that you believe is required for um, for, for MHHS, that would be really helpful for us to substantiate that 12 month period. At this point, we haven't completed our evidence gathering, so we haven't been able to challenge the 12 months. So we've just retained the 12 months that that sit um, uh, that that sit in in, in the timescales. Um, the second thing just to highlight with migration, if you're a SIP participant, um, you'll be able to start migration early and therefore um, um, there is the potential to have some additional time to complete that for M15. If you're coming through as a qualification participant, then um, the assumption is that those coming in early still have the 12 months as above. But the later you come through qualification, the the shorter the implication that the implication is that the shorter the period you have for migration is. So um, again, if you're if you're looking to come in later as a qualification participant, if you're in a later tranche than the first tranche um, on the assumption we're using tranches of qualification, then um, then then there will be a reduced time frame for migration um, as set out in this plan. So again, um, I wanted to highlight the, the time scales, the um, difference in approach between the SIP participants and the qualification participants, and just encourage any feedback on, on the migration aspects as well as your DBT and your approach to testing, whether you're going to participate in SIT, et cetera. So just before we run out of time, I just wanted to highlight some of those back end activities as, as well. Obviously happy to take any any questions around any parts of the plan. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions. Um, I, I'm sure in one of the sessions I heard that everyone was going to go live before migration would commence. Is that true or is that not true? That's that's not true. If we are um, if we are taking the reverse migration approach, which is an assumption that underpins all of this, then what we're trying to do is provide the facility for those that are ready to start migration to start migration as soon as they can once they've completed SIT. So if you're a if you're a SIT participant and you've completed your SIT execution, like the red the red critical path along the top, you've done your qualification, you've prepared for go live, you can start your migration um, in line with M11. Um, uh, as I can't see the top of the screen, but that is M11 as per the blue. If you're going mm -hmm. through qualification, then you will start later because qualification won't start until functional SIT is completed. So that's why qualification execution at the bottom is staggered slightly behind the end of SIT execution because it's the completion of functional SIT. And, and you will not be able to migrate if, you, if you're a non-SIT participant until you've completed qualification, which is the start of migration at the bottom. So there is an advantage of being a SIP participant because you'll be able to start migration earlier. OK, thank you. And the other question. Sorry, sorry go on. Sorry, just just to add to that, you you were not mistaken. That was the case for round one of the consultation that each segment would everybody would go live on the same day. And that's yeah. one of the major things that we've Many changed challenges. in this. Yeah. Yeah. OK, yeah. thank you for that. And the, the you, other thank question. You, <laughs> I don't feel I'm so, so mad now, but uh, no, it's, no, it, it is no. a funda it's a fundamental change of approach this time round, Laurie, in that we yep. are assuming reverse migration in, yep. in this version and, and not the all go at the same time. And that facilitates the early movers. Yep. I've been struggling with the idea of why was reversal required if we were all going live together and therefore yep. everyone would be on it. <laughs> OK, I, that, yep. that makes sense to me now thank you okay and the other right. question was i'd heard that there was a limit on twenty-five thousand pound migration 
transactions a day, which over a period of 365 days is about 9.13 million MPAN, but that's per region, is it? So, so we haven't set any constraints around the migration processes itself at the moment, but our, our understanding are, is that there are volume constraints associated with MPRS. There are currently um, restrictions placed on bulk change of agent activity of 20,000 um, a, a day. So there are existing constraints in, in the systems as they are now, but we haven't yet confirmed how they apply for MHHS, Laurie. Um, our understanding is that that is on a, a DNO license area by DNO license area. Yeah. So it's not aggregate, it is by 14 DNO license area, but we will confirm any constraints um, as part of our migration work. And, and it's one of the reasons why we as the SI are managing migration. It's so that we can um, proactively manage against any volume constraints that might sit in the market. Yeah. OK, grateful. Thank you. I'm glad we got, got just managed to squeeze in the migration discussions before we run out of time. Thank you for the questions, Laurie. And any more questions, particularly around the back end, as we've covered quite a lot of the SIT stuff? Tom. Yeah, just for clarity then, Jason, the blue bar of migration, the purple bar of migration, could mean that the overall migration window is a lot longer than 12 months. It is by implication longer than 12 months because M11 starts in August 2025 and M15 is on October 2026. So, so that is the period of migration. It starts on M11 and finishes at M15. OK, interesting. Because we're allowing people to go early, yet we're maintaining a 12 month uh, migration window for those that come in later. Well, based on your diagram, the last tranche four coming in doesn't get 12 months. It doesn't. That's what I was highlighting earlier. Yeah. If, you, if you're last in, you get from March 2026 to October 2026. Yeah. OK, thank you. OK, I think just, he's warm. Before we wrap, Keith, it may be worthwhile just saying that the approach to sit is different for the POAP too, as Keith yes. um, said before, and that's that's not around allowing everybody in. It's allowing it's it's having a restricted number going through quickly, and you know people have to turn up on the date specified, and then we they we get them through sit as quickly as possible. So that is a different approach again. Sorry, Keith. I'll, go ahead. No, it's fine. Uh, I was just going to say, and uh, by way of wrap up, that there may be questions that people want to ask uh, bilaterally to us rather than in the group. So therefore, I just going to remind people that if you want to send anything to the PMO mailbox, they'll um, they'll point the question at the right people in the team, and we'll get back to you. So there's still uh, the opportunity to do that, or any conversations that you might want to have in the coming days leading up to the deadline of next Friday. You know, don't don't feel shy. Just let us know, and we'll do our best to support you. Uh, through this because we, we know that this is a process that's not completely sorted and settled yet. It's still uh, some weeks to go in it, which is the nature of planning. So, you know, keep keep the faith, keep the patience, uh, do the best job you can on the responses because we really appreciate your help and getting the ammo uh, to kind of get this uh, settled in the in the right way and, and, and to buy you into the you know, a delivery plan that is realistic and to Tom's point as early as possible. Um, and not slipping too much from the timetable. That's obviously off Jim, off Jim's wish too. So I think we've made that really clear, uh, but we've also made clear that we want to uh, be open and transparent with you both ways. So, you know, don't hold back in the consultation responses. Tell us the way it is, tell us like it is, and then we'll use that. And if there's some useful nuggets in that, in those responses that we can amplify through the, the next iteration of plan, we'll certainly do that as well. So thank you for your time. Do appreciate it. Um, hope you have a good weekend when you get there and uh, we will speak with you soon. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.